Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I hope all is well during these crazy times. Um, we'll just have to mute this. So, um, the aim of this session is to demystify the blockchain, DLT, cryptocurrency, and smart contract buzzwords. It's a non-technical introduction. So if you are a software developer or you have a technical background, you may want to big, dig a bit deeper. Um, feel free to get in touch with us and we can have discussions after this session because we really want to keep this session to a general overview and a non-technical introduction. Um, if you want to ask a question, ask it inside of the comments box, inside of Facebook, and we'll do our best to get back as soon as possible. Um, so this online lecture is organized as a number of different parts delivered by myself, Joshua, and Gordon. Uh, Gordon, are, are you here? Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, the lecture will um, involve, like I said, these various different parts. And just to give you an idea, um, both myself and I, we lecture and coordinate the Masters in Blockchain and DLT held at the University of Malta within the Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies. So I hope this helps you to get over a bit of uh, COVID boredom, and uh, I hope uh, that you find this interesting. In this session, we plan to demystify the blockchain, smart contract, distributed ledger technology, and cryptocurrency space. And this is really meant as a non-technical introduction to blockchain and DLT. Um, we will dig deeper into the technicalities of blockchain and DLT in other lectures. So if you are interested, please get in touch with us. Uh, we run a multidisciplinary master's at the University of Malta within the Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies. And the idea behind the program is to take in um, IT professionals, law professionals, and business finance and economics professionals. And we give each student um, an introduction to the field, an introduction to the areas that they're not experts in. And then we dig deeper into each student's um, particular area. Of specialization but again in this particular lecture we're just going to provide an overview um, of the blockchain space and we're intending to demystify what does blockchain mean to the common person who's not necessarily a technical literate individual introduction if we consider how services have really been um, provided since really the very beginning of time until around the mid 90s, it involves going to a physical location and interacting with an individual at the particular locations. So you would interact with a teller at the bank and you might interact with other individuals at let's say a, a postal service. So there is really this requirement of physical um, service provision by going to the location where that particular service was provided. And then in the mid 90s, along came the internet revolution. And using the internet, we could, we could undertake information retrieval. We could buy books online or um, bank online. We could send in our money to various individuals around the world by logging into our computers, which were available from the comfort of our homes or our offices. And then in the mid 2000s, along came the mobile revolution. And the very same services we talked about before could now be used from the comfort of wherever we are by reaching into our pockets. So we had um, access to mobile banking. We could now shop online. And now that the blockchain revolution is upon us, or at least it's touted to be a revolution, um, which really emerged in the beginning 2010s, mid 2010s, what is going to change in how we actually interact with the services? If you look at the internet, it's very easy to comprehend how services were changed. It's very easy to comprehend how mobile services changed the way that services were, pro were provided. You could now get access to those services by reaching into your mobile. But what is that blockchain actually going to change in respect to the service provision? And the answer is, it's really not going to change much in the way that services are provided. And if it's not changing how services are provided, then what is changing? And it's all about trust. So it's going to change the way 
that we need to have trust in the central service provider. It's going to allow to remove that trust and we'll be able to provide services without having such central service providers. Doing away with trust. If we look at how services are currently provided, let's say you look at how Amazon provides its services. Amazon is a central service provider where different distributors trust Amazon with their books and their products. And they trust that when Amazon sells their books that they will receive funds. And let's say when consumers buy books from Amazon, they trust that they will receive the products in exchange for the funds that they have sent to Amazon. Similarly, banks provide a, a central service. So when we go to a bank and we open up a bank account, we deposit our funds in that bank account and we trust the bank with our money. We trust that when we want to undertake a transaction, that the bank will use the money that we've deposited in their institution in the way that we would like them to do so. So there's complete trust in the bank to undertake these particular transactions for us. If we look at how payments are made nowadays, let's say that we have Bob here, and Bob would like to send 10,000 euros to Alice. So he goes to the bank and he tells the bank, I would like to send 10,000 euros to Alice, please. And the bank says, what is it for? And rightly so, because the bank needs to abide by aspects of anti-money laundering and prevention of funding of terrorism. Um, so they need to make sure that these transactions are not for any illicit activity. But Bob's, Bob says, I would rather not say it's private. Perhaps Bob lives in a very small uh, city or town and um, Bob doesn't want to disclose to the teller what he's buying. Perhaps he knows the teller and perhaps he's buying some childish toys from Alice and he doesn't want to reveal this. And if he doesn't, the bank says, well, well I'm sorry, we cannot do that for you. And Bob says, it's my money. Why can I not transfer my money to Alice? Why do I need the bank's um, approval? Now, we're not questioning whether that approval should be there or not, but this is really where Bitcoin all started. So Bob here wishes that there was a way that he could send his money directly to Alice without having any intermediary, without having any service provider who needs to approve or can potentially reject, reject the transaction that Bob would like to undertake. And this is what Bitcoin says. Games. So the ability to have person-to-person, peer-to-peer transactions where anyone can transfer funds to anyone else inside of this network of individuals partaking in the system. And there's no single intermediary who can stop this transaction. So really, if you consider cash, this is kind of how cash works, right? We can pass on cash directly to any other user if they accept that cash, and there's no one who can stop that transaction. Obviously here, we don't want to use cash here. The proposal was to use Bitcoin, which one could consider is a digital form of cash, where no central service provider can stop that transaction. Decentralizing money. And if you consider how to implement a centralized digital system from the technology aspect, so let's say we wanted to create a system, a banking system, to handle transactions for the bank. That's quite easy to do. What you would do is you would create a database system at the bank and for each different user, for each different account holder, you would create an account inside the database. And whenever there's a transaction, you deduct the funds from the sender and you increase the funds to the recipient. It gets slightly more complicated when you want to implement a a system for uh, uh, financial institutions where it's not a single bank, but it's a number of different banks working together. Um, so it gets slightly more complicated, but it's still quite easy to do because each bank will have their own system and the banks will transfer money amongst each other to make sure that the funds are transferred for the particular transactions. And let's say that this 
individual wants to send funds to this recipient over here, um, the bank will make sure that the funds associated with that transaction are correctly sent to the recipient's bank. And the recipient's bank will make sure that those funds are correctly deposited into this individual's account. So let's say that we do not have a digital ledger system yet, but we have a physical ledger that we'll be using. So let's assume that I am going to keep this ledger and only I have access to the ledger. And anytime anyone wants to initiate a transaction, they have to let me know. Joshua, can you please send my funds to this individual. And I will do this by writing in the transaction into the physical ledger. And I'll do this by making sure that a number of rules are kept. So that's quite easy to do, right? Because we just have one book. If you let me know, I'll process the transactions. So uh, one person cannot spend funds that do not belong to them. We cannot allow for all transactions to be changed. We cannot allow for old transactions to be removed. And also, if an individual doesn't have funds, we will not allow for that transaction to be written. Now, very importantly for the system to work, there can only be one book. There can only be one ledger. If there's more than one of these ledgers, we somehow need to make sure that they're in sync, that, and that's gonna be quite complicated if there's another individual where we always need to call each other up, right? So. Just for now, we're assuming that there's this one book and I am making sure that these rules are enforced and no one can complete the book except for myself abiding by these particular rules. Now, if we created a centralized system, a computer system that enforced exactly this, which is exactly what banks do, they will uphold these particular rules. So they don't allow for individuals to spend more than they actually have. They don't allow for transactions to be changed or removed, or at least they shouldn't, right? Um, there's only one ledger, so the bank keeps its own single ledger, and no one can manipulate the book except for them. And that is exactly the point of what we're coming to. It is the owner of the ledger who can manipulate it. And as users, we are trusting the owner to make sure that they are upholding these rules. What happens if on the previous ledger, what happens if I want to break the rules? If I want to give myself more funds or if I want to give one of my friends more funds than he should have received? What happens if the bank does this? And really, it's not a question of trusting or not trusting the bank. It's a question of trusting or not trusting the single, this central this provider. So if we wanted to get around this problem, we'll have a single entity, a single service provider that we need to trust. We can implement a system where there is no central service provider and everyone has a copy of the ledger, removing that service provider. So we don't have to trust any particular entity. And we do this by exactly that, by duplicating the ledger at every single person, at every single peer in the network. So there's no single owner who can manipulate the book. And if we want to implement a system like this, where we do have no central authority, where every single node needs to have a complete list of all accounts and all balances and all transactions. So when a transaction takes place, that transaction is sent to every single node or computer or individual in the network. That is not something which is easy to do, but we need to make sure this happens because otherwise, if we don't implement this type of system, then we go back to a single service provider. And to implement this decentralized ledger where there is no single owner who can manipulate that book, the blockchain comes in. The solution is a cunning ledger called the blockchain, which enables for this decentralized network to be implemented. Now, this quote has been taken from The End of Money by New Scientist. This is um, a really great book for an introductory uh, read on blockchain. 
I mean, by, it's a bit outdated now in regards to history, but I still recommend it as a first read to blockchain. So again, I want to reiterate the fact that now that there's no single central authority and every single node, every computer, every user has a list of all transactions and all accounts and all balances in the system. And in fact, if you look at what we're storing at each place, it's a ledger. It is a ledger of transactions. And this ledger only allows for new transactions to be added. Old transactions can never be removed. Or you've probably heard, if you've been looking to this a bit, that the blockchain is immutable. But rather, the blockchain isn't really immutable, because immutable means it doesn't change. And the blockchain is append only. It allows for transactions to be added to it. But the history of each transaction is immutable in the blockchain. But really, if we look at how in users will interact with these different services, it's going to be almost indistinguishable from using a normal website system or any other service or type of system. So the user will request a service, they may pay for the service, they may go into some agreement for the service, but they're using an interface that to them, it's nothing more than perhaps a web interface. So it's not really the service that's going to change, but it's the level of trust needed in, in the central service providers that is going to change because we're going to be removing central authorities, central points of trust from the service being offered. If you look at Bitcoin, you can see that Bitcoin is really a ledger. It's a ledger which enforces so only the owner of their Bitcoin can transfer their Bitcoin. No one else should be able to transfer their Bitcoin. Only one transaction can be performed at a time, and this isn't really true. So really, um, transactions are uh, merged into a single block. And in Bitcoin, a block takes 10 minutes, but we won't go into the mechanics of how that works. For simplicity's sake, just consider for now, there's one transaction that takes place at a time. And when a transaction occurs, when a transfer has occurred, those old transfers can neither be manipulated or deleted or lost. So if we consider, let's say we have these users who have accounts. So I, Joshua, have 10 Bitcoin, Gordon has three Bitcoin, and Alice has six Bitcoin. If I want to send to Gordon three Bitcoin, what we will do is just increase Gordon's Bitcoin by three and decrease my Bitcoin by three. Similarly, if I want to send one Bitcoin to Alice, increase one Bitcoin into Alice's account and decrease one Bitcoin from my account. And similarly, if Alice then sends three of her Bitcoin to Gordon, increase Gordon's account with three Bitcoin and decrease Alice's by three Bitcoin. Right, so at this particular abstraction, it's just a ledger. From the user's perspective, it's a single ledger keeping track of the different transactions, balances and accounts in the system, really under the hood. So really, there is a system of computers working together to provide this abstraction, but to most users, this is what it provides. Bitcoin and private blockchains. I would like to remind you that if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat, uh, the videos, comments uh, bar, so that we can, uh, at one of these uh, pauses, we can uh, stop the video and explain uh, and answer your questions. So let's say you want to start using Bitcoin. How would you go about doing this? Well, traditionally, what you would need to do is install what we call Bitcoin full node. It's a piece of software that is publicly available because Bitcoin is a public blockchain, which means it allows for everyone to join it. And we'll come to that in a bit. And you download this software and you run it on your computer. And the full node will connect and sync to the other Bitcoin nodes in the network. And it will download all the data that is on the other Bitcoin nodes. 
you can then, once you have the full node software installed on your computer and it's synchronized with the network, you can then send money or rather Bitcoin to other participants in the network. You can also receive Bitcoin from other users and really you're not receiving the funds to your specific computer, but it's the single shared ledger that this network creates where the transaction is written to. The full note allows for you to interact with that shared ledger. So if you're using this piece of software, you can then send funds, you can send Bitcoin and receive Bitcoin. When you see in your software, whether it's running on your computer, when you see received funds, you call it, you can be guaranteed that those funds have actually been received inside of your Bitcoin wallet if you're using such a full node. When you send funds to another individual who might not necessarily have a full node set up, they just have an account. And um, when you send funds to an individual, there's no single central authority who can approve that, who needs to approve that transaction or who can reject the transaction because it is a decentralized network where there is no central point of trust. Now that's one way of using a blockchain network by downloading the software and interacting with it directly. And here we talk about the full nodes and indeed there are other types of nodes out there that we won't go into in this lecture, but just to let you know that there are some drawbacks of having a full node such as you need all the transactions. So there are other ways of connecting to the network, but we'll ignore that for now for this lecture. A second way to use Bitcoin or to use blockchain systems are to use web servers or websites or some service who has the node software installed on their device. And then you are able to connect to the Bitcoin or the blockchain network through their server or their service. Now, here it's very important to note that when you're using such services where you're not interacting directly with the blockchain or with a blockchain, and you're connecting to a website who is interacting with the blockchain on your behalf, and you lose that trusted environment, and suddenly you have to trust that service provider who is providing that web service or that service that you are connecting to. So he, over here, you can see that this service provider over here, again, goes back to the single central point of trust. And you need to question whether you do trust that. And to say the truth, it's all about trust. Whether you're trusting the service provider over here or whether you install the software over here, it's still about trust. Suddenly, you're trusting that the software, that the network works correctly. And indeed, if you're a developer, you can build that trust quite easily by looking at the code. If you're not a developer, well, for now, you need to listen to some individuals telling you that, yes, it works. But really, you need to build that trust or you need to trust someone who will allow for you to build that trust. But if you consider that in this sense where you're trusting a central service provider, there's nothing you can do but trust them to have faith in the system. In a blocking network like this, where you can install the software, you can consider the, the service to have been democratized in that you can get full trust in the system by learning to develop, learning to understand the code, and you can suddenly build your own trust that that code works. So I, I've said a number of times that every computer in blockchain, in every node, you can see all transactions. It keeps track of all transactions, all data, all accounts, right? So this might raise issues of confidentiality and data privacy. Like if I have Bitcoin, I mean that everyone knows how much Bitcoin I own. And the answer is kind of yes and it's kind of no. It's kind of yes because like I said, all accounts, all balances, all transactions are available for everyone to see. It's kind of no though because those transactions are not directly associated with you as an individual. So Bitcoin only lists your account address and your address 
a long number, let's say, and it's not directly associated to you as an individual. So a lot of people out there say that it's anonymous. It's not really anonymous. It's pseudo-anonymous at best because the first time that you use your account to buy something from an individual or you reveal your account to receive funds from an individual, that individual now knows your account and they can look up all your account history, all transactions you've ever sent or received using Bitcoin or the particular blockchain you're talking about. So the key point really here is that all data is available for all to see when it's recorded on the blockchain. And this is what really when we're talking about a public blockchain, because a public blockchain allows for anyone to connect to it, anyone to download the information and be part of the system. That's one type of blockchain. And then this would raise issues of confidentiality and data protection. So what would we do about storing private information? And this is where private blockchain, permission blockchains come in. So where there is confidential information, you definitely do not want to store that inside of a public blockchain. So all data on a public blockchain is available for all to see. So to get around that, we can use a permissioned or per private blockchain, which limits who is part of the network. So only the individuals, the, the entities or the computers or nodes that we would like to allow inside the network will actually be able to get access to that data and also be part of the network. So anyone else who we do not want to get access to, they can also get access to use the service or be part of that network. If they try to connect, they won't be able to. So it, the, all the principles that apply to our public blockchain still apply to our private blockchain, except for we can limit who gets access, who can be part of that particular network. So that is for permission private blockchains. Okay, so we've had a number of questions. Um, um, we'd just like to start with um, Pierre's question. So Pierre asked, can a transaction which has been verified for some reason or other, um, can it be unexecuted? Can it be um, ignored as though it was not verified in the network? And the short answer, we'll start with the short answer is, one, it, once a transaction is accepted into a blockchain, is it there forever? So the short answer is yes. The long answer is there could happen a particular situation where the network gets split, where it's been verified at one part of the network, but the other part hasn't verified it. This is what we call a fork. And I don't want to go into it right now, but just to give a brief overview of what would happen, um, the part of the network that would verify the next bit of information, the next block quicker, that would be the blockchain that would emerge as the canonical blockchain and all other nodes would then converge to that blockchain. So the short answer is yes, once it's been accepted in the whole blockchain, it'll never be removed. The longer answer is uh, you have to wait a bit more time until it has really been embedded into the blockchain. Um, Gordon, do you want to add a bit on that? Yes, I wanted to um, add something because Pierre also mentioned the issue with high traffic. And uh, indeed, uh, the processing of transactions happens on these nodes that Joshua spoke about in the previous slides, right? And these nodes called miners are processing these transactions and adding them to the ledger. So uh, it, is, it, it, it is the case that if one receives a lot of such transactions, then the miners will be very busy, busy uh, ordering these transactions and adding them to the ledger. Um, they won't be unexecuted, they'll just be delayed until the execution occurs. Um, so, so it is um, uh, possible to have delays, but not, but not losing transactions. And once written on the ledger, it's as Joshua pointed out, there forever. Okay, so the next question from Abdullah. Uh, what happens behind the scenes to secure the whole chain and how the double spending problem is solved? Okay, I think 
that will have to get into uh, the proof of work consensus mechanism in order to answer that. And that goes a bit beyond the level of the introduction that we wanted to handle here, but we'll definitely um, have a chat after for anyone who wants to go a bit more um, in detail in, in regards to how this works. Indeed, we cover all this uh, material very deeply in the technical part of the master's program. Uh, uh, we also had a question just before by Sandra Dingley, who asked whether uh, money laundering institutions can track uh, cryptocurrency transactions. Now, uh, as Joshua pointed out, you know, transactions are re uh, done with reference to an ID, um, uh, 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 um, an ID, uh, 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 a, value, a number which is unique to each user. Um, and typically, there is no direct link between the user and a real person. However, um, uh, typically, when uh, such institutions want to track who a person is, they can, they can investigate and find uh, through the use of transactions, through, through different uh, types of evidence, who that uh, address really uh, refers to. But by default, uh, especially on public blockchains, things have been typically built in such a manner that there is only uh, uh, an ID that refers to a user and not uh, real user information. Okay, we have another question asking, is it really feasible to hold all data on a single device? And if you're running a device in the beginning, it may have. If you're running a device now, probably not because over time, you have more and more data being stored. So Bitcoin, I've just checked it out now, is somewhere between 200 and 300 gigs. Ethereum is in the terabytes, I believe, now. Um, so this, obviously, that's not a, a decent solution, having to store all that data. But now there are solutions out there that are allowing for you to store the data that either that is relevant to you or your application or from a particular point in time. And there's even efforts out there on sharding so that different nodes in the network will, will store different parts of the blockchain ledger. Okay. So... If, if I have, okay, if I have USD and I want to pay someone in euros, do we have a blockchain based platform to make that happen? Okay, so inside of a blockchain, uh, as we're going to see very soon, um, so we've seen how we can store Bitcoin, but we're going to see soon how we can store other things than Bitcoin. Now, if you wanted to store euros in a blockchain, you would need some company who would back that digital asset inside of the blockchain to an actual euro. And, and these, these companies exist. So there are companies that store USD in the blockchain and there are companies that store Euro in the blockchain. But it's very important to note that in these types of systems, you are trusting the individuals behind that initiative to have the Euros or to have the dollars in exchange for those digital assets. And the next question uh, was regarding the number of nodes, whether there's a minimum or optimal number of nodes. And um, particularly with public blockchains, um, uh, the, the more nodes you have, the more secure it is because uh, consensus is reached across a bigger number of nodes and trying to attack uh, the blockchain by hijacking um, uh, more than 50% of the nodes of the, of, the, of the blockchain network is more difficult. So there is in fact no optimal number one could argue that there is a minimum number depending on the security you want, um, but it's really a probabilistic analysis that one would have to do. Then there are the private blockchains that all, uh, and permission blockchains that also uh, um, Joshua spoke about in the previous slides, where the processing is done in a slightly different way. There are different solutions out there, um, and therefore the number of nodes required for that to work well is, uh, is, is different. It doesn't have to be so big. Okay, so um, Stefan asked, how capable is the blockchain at this time to process enormous numbers of transactions in real time? So I would say th there's this big debate between uh, blockchain versus traditional systems. And you often hear people saying, oh, our blockchain is very efficient. The truth is what we're comparing is a single computer in isolation or a network of computers working against distributed systems across the world. Now, it's not really a case of blockchain or not, but it's a case of centralization versus decentralization. A single computer, a single system governed by a single company, let's say Visa, is always going to be faster than a decentralized system. 
I, so there's, there's no debate there. Um, now, is blockchain capable of processing enormous numbers of transactions? We can't really answer that because it depends on the blockchain you're using. So Gordon and myself can set up a blockchain, let's say between the universities. Actually, we're involved in a blockchain initiative across universities. And because there will be a small number of nodes in that blockchain, we could have high processing rates. However, we're never going to match the processing rates of a centralized system. And that's because of a number of different reasons that we, uh, mechanisms that we use to achieve um, decentralization. However, there are ways to perform certain processing offline and then put the proof on the blockchain. Uh, but um, that's, that's the short answer. I'm not sure if Gordon wants to add anything to that. Um, no, indeed, uh, there are different implementations and uh, the idea of the blockchain does not exist. I mean, there are, there are different ways of uh, building such decentralized ledgers, which is why we typically prefer to use the, the, the more generic term DLT. Actually, we will be talking about this in a moment, um, distributed ledger technologies, because there are different solutions out there which have different, uh, different uh, advantages and different processing speeds, etc. Now we have a question regarding whether it's possible to program to code blockchain in C-sharp. Yes, indeed, you, you know, blockchain is just a, a, an algorithm, a, a, a system that can be programmed in any programming language. In fact, on that point, inside our masters, um, our students are building a blockchain from scratch. Some of them are using C-sharp, some are using Python. So um, blockchain is just the algorithms and you can do that really in any language. Okay, so Eman asked if this will be available later on. So the plan is yes, uh, providing that the tools that we're using are properly recording it. Um, but the plan is yes to have it available there. But um, just in case it doesn't, I don't recommend leaving yet. Okay. So since Bitcoin is still so volatile in its price, how can I assert that when receiving a transaction from another person, that transaction will keep the same value? So you cannot there, there there's no guarantee so um if i were to ask you what would the price of um a loaf of bread cost in a few weeks time or a few days time it might be quite stable but you never know right so it, it's it's an issue of demand and supply and i think gordon you're going to cover a bit on money a bit later in the lecture i'll be mentioning it briefly later on but yes indeed i mean the well if it's one Bitcoin, it will remain one Bitcoin, right? But the price of one Bitcoin with respect to, to traditional um, uh, money, traditional currencies, Euro, US dollars will, will change. So, um, so indeed, that is, that is uh, a, a challenge on its own right to study the volatility of such cryptocurrencies and see how, how effectively such cryptocurrencies can be, can be, can be um, uh, stabilized, etc. So Martin asked if a full node is a mining node. And uh, no, typically the mining node is a different piece of software, which is also a full node. But then and again, we're just talking terminology. Um, you could have another implementation that inside of what they call a full, full node that does mine. And also besides that, there are different um, ways of reaching consensus. Mining is one way, but I don't want to go into that in this lecture. I have a question regarding uh, how consensus is uh, reached across the different nodes. In fact, it's an important, very important question to understand how uh, blockchain works. What we're trying to focus in this lecture is uh, rather than how it works, then looking underneath the hood of how uh, uh, blockchain works is looking at what it guarantees, what it means to the end user. Uh, we go into all this uh, in the course in a more technical way. Um, however, in this lecture, we'll be, we'll be keeping things at a more user-centric perspective, from a more user-centric perspective. So, Angelo asked, what hap will happen if Bitcoin mining is not profitable anymore? As time goes by, the number of Bitcoins rewarded for, to miners will be lowered. Um, so, we don't know what's going to happen. We do know that in the case of Bitcoin, the reward is halved every so often. Um, but will miners stop to mine? So if the miners deem that the expense of mining is so large that it's not worth mining, yes, you may have all miners who stop. And if that's the case, then the, the Bitcoin um, blockchain will no longer exist or, or it will exist up to a particular point. Um, so I guess, well, I, I, and then I, as long as there's at least one node working, the blockchain remains alive. That being said, the lesser nodes that you have, 
then the more likelihood there is that you can have an attack, but we won't, we won't go into the attacks here either. Okay, so if the chain continues to grow and no entries are deleted, then does that mean that later transactions would take more time to be verified since there's more data to run through? Um, no, so each block that we process at a time, uh, it takes, in the case of Bitcoin, it takes 10 minutes and it takes 10 minutes to finalize by design. It's not because of it's taking that long due to the processing. It's by design that they want to take 10 minutes to close off every block. So as new transactions get added into it, it's still going to take 10 minutes to add new transactions into that block. That being said, some people recommend that you wait what they call six blocks, which would take up to an hour. Different blockchains have different mechanisms. And another blockchain, Ethereum, the block time is 10 seconds, so it would take roughly a minute to get a transaction in. Now, if you wanted to verify the whole chain separately, which you wouldn't do very often, then yes, you would have to run through the whole chain. We had a comment saying that it would be great to introduce other use cases of blockchain. In fact, later on in, the, in, the, in this presentation, we'll be looking at other applications of blockchain rather than focusing on uh, particular blockchain implementations like Bitcoin, Libra, etc. We'll be focusing on, on the uses, the applications of blockchain. But indeed, it's also interesting to see how these differ. Um, however, for the sake of this, uh, of this short presentation, uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll not be doing that. Uh, comparison. Okay, and Lauren asked, wouldn't a private blockchain not have the distributed parts in it, in the DLT? So distribution in computer science means a number of computers working together. It's not really concerned with who owns those computers. Now, when we come to what a private blockchain is or what a permission blockchain is, there's a lot of terminology out there which isn't really clear. What we like to use to define private or permission blockchains are blockchains that were set up with certain rules defining who can take part in that blockchain. It could be me, myself, running a blockchain only for, let's say, the Center for Distributed Ledger Technologies, or it could be me, myself, along with you, Lauren, and along with Gordon. So we've defined the rules in regards to who can take part in it. And the distributed part is still there because we have different computers working together. If you're running a blockchain on a single computer, that's probably not a good idea. So you probably shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so we'll get uh, going on the second, uh, almost halfway, no, I, I, we actually have a bit more than halfway through, but we'll get going. If you have more questions, do please pop them in the question box and we'll answer them at a convenient point. Terminology. So to disambiguate a bit of terminology, um, this is probably a good time because I've mentioned Bitcoin, which is the and blockchain, which is the mechanism that allows for it to work. So Bitcoin is the first and is not only the first cryptocurrency, it is one instance of a cryptocurrency. There are many other types of cryptocurrencies out there, and we will talk about another type in this lecture. A cryptocurrency is just one application, it's just one thing we can build, one service that can be implemented using a blockchain. And the blockchain is just one type, one way to achieve a distributed ledger. So DLT stands for Distributed Ledger Technologies, and blockchain is just one type of a DLT. There are other ways of implementing a distributed ledger, such as a directed acyclic graph, DAGs, um, which are used in uh, IOTA, hash graphs, and other types that we won't go into. So each DLT could be either public, allowing for anyone to get access to it, or could be private or permissioned. Like we said before, Bitcoin is a public blockchain. Beyond money. So let us summarize uh, what guarantees blockchain gives us. As we've seen, blockchain is a way of keeping a distributed ledger to keep track of who owns how much of a particular digital resource, for example, Bitcoin. Since this is a digital uh, implementation of, of this concept of ownership of, say, Bitcoin, blockchain also must guarantee uh, a number of properties, including the idea of single ownership, which means that if I 
uh, own one Bitcoin, then I am the only one who can spend that one Bitcoin. The concept of no overspending, if I have one Bitcoin, then I cannot spend more than one Bitcoin. And no double spending. So if I have one Bitcoin, I cannot make two copies of that single Bitcoin. Use one to buy something and use the other copy to buy something else. The ledger also guarantees that copies of the ledger are kept on different nodes, on different computers, which means that there is no single central place where all this data is being kept. In addition, the history of transactions, what transactions took place in the past, cannot be modified. And yet, all this requires no central authority. So there is no central governing uh, party that can decide whether a transaction goes through, that can decide to cancel a transaction, which can decide to create a redundant transaction or, or anything of the sort. But when we look at these properties, these guarantees that blockchain gives us, one of the things you might notice is that this is not restricted to the concept of money. In fact, these guarantees correspond to the concept of ownership. Single ownership is really about, I am the only one who's holding something in my hand. No overspending corresponds to the fact that if I have a physical object in my hand, then I cannot spend or give two copies of that object to someone else. Similarly with uh, double spending. And therefore, um, blockchain can be used to store ownership of any digital asset and not just cryptocurrencies as most people perceive it to, to hold. So for example, let's look at the case where we have a national property register. So this would be a register which stores who owns which property. Now, if we implement the register as a blockchain, then what we will do is that these transactions will be written on the blockchain. So for example, if Paul sold Joshua a property to 112 Triel Belt Floriana, then Paul would write on the blockchain the transaction which says Paul to Joshua and this particular asset. Only Paul can write this because ownership currently resides with Paul. And through this, through this transaction written on the blockchain, the ownership of the property will be now transferred to Joshua. So now Joshua can decide to sell his property to Gordon. And in order to do so, he sends another transaction to the blockchain which says that Joshua sells the property to 112 Triel Belt Floriana to Gordon. And similarly, we can use this blockchain to keep track of transfers of properties. What is interesting is that the properties we saw earlier are the properties that a national registry of properties typically ensures that are guaranteed. For example, if I own a property, then I am the only one who can transfer that property. If I own a property, I cannot sell it to more than one person. If I own a property, I can only transfer it once, etc. Use case to motivate smart contracts. Let us look at another example. The tracking of rights and ownership of Malta parking passes. The idea behind Malta parking passes would be an initiative to try to encourage people to use public transport, to use their cars less, etc. The core of the idea is that these Malta parking passes can be used to park in reserved places. So imagine that there are gold bordered parking places all around Malta and you can park in these spending Malta parking passes. So if we look at the third property that we're showing in this slide, you can park in a reserved parking by spending five MPPs. And how do you gain these MPPs? Well, every time you use a bus, you would get one MPP for free. And in addition, if you do not use an MPP for parking for a whole week, then you get three MPPs for free as well. So the, these two rules would be encouraging people to use their cars less in order to gain MPPs to be able to park more easily. And then we would also like to ensure that people can trade and sell MPPs to other people. So if I don't own a car and I will never need my MPPs, then I can sell the MPPs I gain to someone else who requires the MPPs to park on a regular basis. When you think about it, ownership of MPPs can be stored in a digital format, can be stored on a computer. And if we store this ownership on a distributed ledger, on a blockchain, then we can store transactions very easily. So, for example, if we start off in a state in which Joshua owns five MPPs, Gordon owns one, 
Alice owns 10 and the Malta Parking Pass Authority owns zero, then whenever Alice parks in an MPP reserved place, then Alice will be using up five MPPs and she will be giving them to the Malta Parking Pass Authority, thus updating the entries in the blockchain. So this sounds like another use case in which we can use blockchain to keep track of ownership of these assets and have guarantees that no one else can interfere with our use of these assets. But there is still one underlying point of trust that is important to highlight. How can we trust that the Malta Parking Pass Limited will really give me three MPPs if I do not use my car for a whole week? Now, this is a promise that they made. There is nothing in the blockchain that will ensure that the Malta Parking Pass Limited will give me those three MPPs at the end of the week. I am trusting them that they will really give me those three MPPs. These guarantees still require us to trust the central authority, in this case, the Malta Parking Pass Limited. So how can we address this issue? Um, there was a question regarding the um, uh, digital assets um, uh, storing properties, for example, by the registry office. Um, uh, in fact, this use case of using a registry office will be looked at, looked at in a bit more detail in a few slides time. So we'll keep that till later. If you've still got questions regarding this, then we can, we can discuss them um, uh, after that section. Smart contracts. Apart from blockchain, possibly one of the most used buzzwords in this field is that of smart contracts. So let us start by seeing what smart contracts really are. Nick Zabo in 1996 came up with this concept of what he called smart contracts, contracts that went beyond what traditional legal contracts achieve. Traditional legal contracts are documents which talk about the rights and obligations of different parties but they talk about ideal behavior. So a legal contract might say that Gordon must pay Joshua one euro at the end of the week. It doesn't mean Gordon will really pay Joshua at the end of the week. It says that there is an agreement for Gordon to do so. Legal contracts work because they reside in a legal framework, which ensures that if Gordon does not follow the ideal behavior as identified in the legal contract, then Joshua, can sue Gordon for breach of contract. In contrast, Nick Sabo said, wouldn't it be great if we could write contracts that self-enforce themselves? His idea was being able to write an agreement which would automatically take that one euro from um, uh, Gordon's account and put it in Joshua's account at the end of the week. In a way, a bank standing order in which I give instructions to my bank so as to transfer one euro at the end of this week to Joshua can be seen as a smart contract. But in order to be able to execute this type of smart contract, there is the bank which is acting as a point of trust in which both Joshua and I need to trust. In 2013, we saw the launch of Ethereum Ethereum is a blockchain similar to Bitcoin, except that it has an additional feature, which is that of smart contracts. Ethereum allowed people to write not only transactions onto the blockchain, which says that Gordon is transferring to Joshua one, one Ether, which is the native cryptocurrency on Ethereum, but it also allows us to write smart contracts, which self-execute over the blockchain. So let's see how this works to really understand what it's all about. This is a screenshot from the website of a real estate agency. On this website, the real estate agency, Greater Charleston, is promising that when a client of theirs buys or sells a home with them, then 10% will be donated to the charity of their choice. Sounds good, sounds great, but some people might not trust the real estate agency. How do I know that if I've bought a house with them, then 10% of their profits will really go to the charity that I mentioned. Well, there are different solutions that we can uh, apply to solve this problem of trust. Solution number zero, the simplest solution is to, to sign an agreement between the real estate agency and myself as their client, 
saying that 10% of the profits will go to the charity of my choice. We have an agreement which says that they should do so. It doesn't mean they will, but they should do so. This works in practice, except that it still leaves an onus on me to have to ensure that they were not in breach of contract. One step further up the ladder is to use a trusted third party. The real estate agency and I can choose uh, a trusted public notary, for example, and uh, this individual will be, will be the person who will receive my money and will be giving the money to both the charity and the real estate agency. Since I trust this third party, then I trust that the 10% will really go to the charity. Since the real estate agency also trusts this third party, they know that they will get their money. But all this is dependent on all parties trusting this third party. And that this third party actually acts according to the rules agreed upon by the two parties. Can we somehow remove that point of trust, this trusted third party, to make this transaction? The way to do it is using a smart contract. So what is a smart contract? A smart contract is an artifact which can store digital assets in the same way that I can own digital assets. A smart contract can also own digital assets. It can execute logic, executable logic. It can run a computer program. It can run instructions. Think of it as executing instructions written um, in code. And all this is done in a trustless manner on the blockchain. So there is no trusted party that is executing this code. Let's take a look at a concrete example, how we would implement this particular case to understand better what I mean by these smart contracts. In order to implement this agreement, I will write this smart contract that we see on the slide. I will call this contract 10% and it will have some written instructions which will be executed uh, within it. Initially, the contract says that the company balance is set to zero and it has two buttons. Think of A and B that we see on this slide as two different buttons that one can press on this smart contract. Button A is the button I press when I buy a property. So I put the payment into the smart contract pressing button A. And what the instructions beneath button A say is the following. Anyone may transfer a particular amount in cryptocurrency to this contract. 10% is immediately sent to the charity. 90% is added to the company's balance. Notice that 10% is immediately given to the charity. 90% we chose to keep it in the smart contract. But then there's a second button, button B, which is called withdrawal of a particular amount. The logic executed when button B is pressed is written here, and we see that what the instructions say, first of all, is that this can only be done by the real estate agency. So if someone else presses the button, then nothing happens. And secondly, that the amount requested must not exceed the amount kept, currently kept in the smart contract. So the real estate agency cannot try to withdraw 20 ether when they only have 10 in the smart contract. And what it does, if these two conditions hold, is that it reduces the company's balance by the amount it's going to give them. And secondly, send that amount of, of cryptocurrency to the real estate company's address. This is what we're seeing here, uh, a smart contract. So when you think of a smart contract, when you read about smart contracts, think about this particular example. It's a set of instructions with different buttons that might be pressed by different parties and with logic written in, which ensures that this behavior is adhered to by the system. So notice that the 10% certainly will go to charity. The company is guaranteed to get its 90% thanks to the logic that we wrote on the smart contract without trusting any third party because all this is being stored on the blockchain. So no third party has to be trusted that these instructions will really be executed. What we see here, is something which is very, very close to the actual computer code. I can translate this into actual computer code in a matter of a few minutes. Some people present the concept of a smart contract in terms of a vending machine. 
And although I don't think it's the most obvious way of understanding what a smart contract is, it is worthwhile looking at so that if you're reading something else and it refers to this metaphor, you understand uh, what is being said better. So think of this smart contract as being this machine here we're seeing on the right, which has two different buttons. Button A allows us to put in some money and I press button A and automatically the cogs and wheels inside the machine will turn when I press button A and the money received will be split into two. 10% will automatically be given to the, to the charity. 90% will be kept inside the machine. Then button B is another button which checks for the fingerprint of the person pressing it. If it is the real estate agency, then the wheels and cogs will turn, uh, check how much money was requested, and based on how much money was requested by the real estate agency, take them from the content of the vending machine and make them available to the real estate agency. When is a blockchain useful? So we've looked at the concepts of blockchain and smart contracts. There are applications where blockchain is a great tool to use and others where it is a really bad tool to use. And as with all technologies, one has to decide whether that is the right technology to solve the problem at hand. It's useless to use a screwdriver to try to hammer in a nail. So one of the first questions we believe one should ask before choosing to use or deploy blockchain technology is whether blockchain is really required, whether smart contracts are really required. And all this boils down to the concept of trust. Do we have a situation where we do not have centralized trust or we would not like to have centralized trust? Is it a number of, for example, insurance companies that need to store information across the companies but would not trust each other to store the information? Secondly, do participants control and transfer resources? As we've seen, blockchain is a great way to store transactions in which we track ownership of resources. Thirdly, do the participant want proof of contract logic? In other words, when we looked at, for example, the Malta parking passes, users wanted the guarantee that if they do not use Malta parking passes for a whole week, then they will get three Malta parking passes for free. Users obviously desire a guarantee that that logic is guaranteed. And if I don't use Malta parking passes to park for a whole week, I will get the bonus ones. Thirdly, do participants want proof of contract logic? For example, when we're speaking about Malta, the Malta parking pass scheme, users would like to have the guarantee that if they do not use Malta parking passes for a whole week, they will get three MTPs for free. Furthermore, does one require decentralization? Many applications out there will work better on a centralized database, having a central database storing all the information. Clearly, others do not but it is useless to use blockchain when a centralized solution is adequate for the problem at hand. Is it data intensive? Keep in mind that on a blockchain, every single node, on a public blockchain, every single node, every single computer will keep a copy of all the transactions. So any data that is stored on the blockchain will be stored by every single node. And obviously that leaves a burden on every single node, which means that Blockchains are designed not to handle uh, massive data in an effective and efficient manner. We really believe that uh, the blockchain is a great solution when it is required. However, if you try to use blockchain in situations where it is not really necessary, you're losing a lot of efficiency and not gaining anything uh, substantial in return. Applications Land registry. If you look at when you require to buy or sell property, you'll probably have an idea of the fact that there is a land registry in your jurisdiction, in your country, that keeps track of who owns what property. And land registries are typically paper based. And even if they are a digital registry, there is still a lot of manual signing of documents that needs to take place when buying or selling of a property occurs. And this involves a huge paper trail. And even in these types of systems and digital types of systems, information can go missing. So whether it's paper or digital based, because a paper can go missing 
a digital entry at the land registry can go missing. It could have been not input in the first place, or it could have been input incorrectly or, or could have been altered after. In fact, uh, just to highlight one note, when I wrote incorrectly, I actually wrote incorrectly, incorrectly. And I left it this way to highlight a point that many out there, I've heard it in the past that these individuals say that the blockchain guarantees that the information is correct. And that's not true. Really, the blockchain guarantees that the information has not changed since it has been input into the system. But it, if you input incorrect information, that incorrect information will exist immutably in the blockchain, right? So garbage in, garbage out. So the blockchain can only guarantee that the information hasn't changed. Now, this process of buying and selling property is quite time consuming. Uh, obviously, depending upon uh, the, the efficiency of the land registry in your country, um, in Malta, this can be quite slow because it involves manually going through papers to make sure that the seller actually owns a property before he can sell it. And this process can be digitized, right? We can create a digital system, which in many countries does exist, which would make the process more efficient. But still, there are these issues of information can go missing. It could have been not input, could have been input correctly. So what would happen is if you own a property and that digital record inside of the land registry goes missing. And if you do look, there are stories and not just stories. I have heard of individuals who have lost their property at particular times because a paper went missing from the land registry. Now, that is not an ideal situation where we should have self-sovereign ownership of our property. We shouldn't be able to lose our property because a paper went missing. So if we were to move over to a blockchain-based solution, this would guarantee that we would have permanent records, permanent documents, files that can never be lost, that can never be changed, and are decentralized. So there's not a single trusted institution that could be destroyed or that could be manipulated so that you lose your property. And just like other digital systems, we could reach instant or near instant processing. And we could reduce the search time to make sure that the seller owns a property down to instant. This could be a huge benefit for land-based registries. And there is an initiative that I had come across, Proppy.com, who have managed, uh, had read to um, cooperate with a particular land registry who are working towards decentralized, a decentralized land registry, allowing for self-sovereign ownership of property, which would allow for decentralized buying and selling of property. So an individual property without having to go to a notary, they could agree outside of any manual process, outside of any centralized process, to buy and sell this property. And very quickly, they, the transfer of ownership of that property could take place, which would minimize any required intermediary fees. And also, there would be no extensive paper. Now, it's very important to note that this sort of system is easy. I wouldn't say easy, but using a blockchain-based system, now that we have blockchain, we can implement these types of decentralized systems that have the ability to have physical ownership defined as virtual ownership of a token within a blockchain. And this needs to be honored inside of the real world that this digital ownership actually translates into physical ownership in the real world outside of blockchain. And this is where efforts need to take place inside of our legal systems. Um, if we really want this to become a reality. Okay, so we have a question from Arumas and he asked, if you own a digital asset, can an existing owner um, still sell the real asset? So if the, if the owner owns the real asset in the real world and you own the digital asset in the blockchain, can the owner of the real world still sell it? 
Well, that really depends on the um, jurisdiction, the regulatory framework that defines ownership. So if a land registry defined its ownership, um, which would be honored within a court of law in the jurisdiction to be the owner of the token really represents the owner inside of the real world, then they can't. I mean, they could still, I guess, give the physical keys to someone, but you could then seek legal recourse. So they could still do it because there's no direct connection between the digital world and the real world. But we would hope that there would be a legal framework in place to handle that. And so it really depends on the jurisdiction to put such digital asset ownership um, matching to real world ownership. Um, Gordon, do you want to add anything there? Um, no, no, I think you covered uh, you covered it uh, comprehensively. Um, uh, we had another question uh, from Alex regarding what stops uh, land registries from switching to blockchain and whether um, uh, we believe that uh, this will happen or not. I think uh, there are there are number of challenges for this thing to happen. Firstly, there's the challenge of um, um, uh, digitization because a lot of the material in many land registries is still not even digitized so that's the first step that is a substantial amount of work which is independent of uh, whether one does this sort of stuff on blockchain or or uh, in a centralized manner secondly there's the question of the regulatory framework which uh, Josh, Joshua has been speaking about there needs to be a regulatory framework which ensures that ownership of the digital asset which represents ownership of the property, it, 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 there is a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between the two. So uh, if we have that, if we have this uh, uh, legislation that ensures that th there's this link between the two, then fine, um, that, would be able, th th that would be possible. However, there are these challenges, uh, which as you can see, more than uh, I would say technical, are, are ones which are more of a regulatory nature and ones which are um, more of a practical nature. I don't know whether you, Joshua, have something to add to that. Um, yeah, so I would just add, um, I've mentioned it in the um, slides, but um, the process of digitization, so moving over, let's say, to a system that the land registry owns, that process is very hard to do. It'll take, uh, especially if you have a land, uh, a paper-based registry, you would need to get all of those papers and turn them into some digital form. Now, irrespective of whether you're going to a digitized system that the land registry owns and monitors in a centralized server system or whether you're going to a blockchain based system that process is still very hard to achieve i think that would be one of the hardest processes to achieve and then there is also the legal uh, hurdles that need to be overcome we had a, a okay. new question just now regarding uh, whether um uh, if, if we have if, if, whether using a uh, land registry digitized on a blockchain platform whether that would mean that there is a that there would have to be a predefined number of properties no um just as with any digital system one can uh, build such a solution to be able to handle the creation of new properties or the destruction of properties indeed um, but it would all be recorded in an immutable way so not only transfers but also the creation of new properties or the destruction of properties would be recorded on the blockchain excellent transport now consider this scenario you wake up an hour early which never happens uh, you do not feel tired so you get up and decide to make your way to work earlier you let your driverless car know that you're not in a rush to get to work and your car realizes that others on the road are in more of a rush. And your car, your driverless car, lets other cars go through so that they can get to work on time. And you're not in a rush, you have time uh, before you need to be at work. And as an incentive, the other cars pay your car 10 national transport tokens or 10 multi-parking passes that we mentioned before and you can use these tokens or passes to buy fuel or to use other public uh, transport now if you think about this scenario is it realistic or is it too far-fetched so in this talk we've demonstrated what blockchain and cryptocurrencies can provide so using a crypto currency or blockchain based token, we can have car to car payments that do not require an intermediary. So we can implement this. This is not a problem. 
Is it still too far-fetched though, the whole concept of driverless cars? Well, really, if you look at the number of different areas around the world, there are prototypes of driverless cars and driverless car infrastructure and test beds. So we're not that far away. And in fact, Ford filed a patent on exactly this that would allow for car-to-car -car payments that could enable such a system to take place that allows for other individuals to pass uh, when they're in more of a rush. Voting. So if we look at voting, uh, some jurisdictions around the world have electronic voting in place. And electronic voting is great, right? Because it can bring convenience, so you don't have to fill out paper forms, very accurate. So there's little error and they should be very efficient. So once all the computers, all the votes have been synchronized in the system, um, the system can then efficiently get out the results without any errors. And this type of system that is providing centralized voting should raise some eyebrows. How can I be sure that my vote was counted? How can I be sure that the vote was not changed? How can I be sure that no one else can see how I voted and use that information in future to decide whether or not to grant permission for a particular request? Right, so these are all issues of trust. Issues of trust because there are central points of trust in this particular system. So you have to trust that piece of software, that computer where you're voting. You have to trust the software developer who wrote that code and the entity behind that voting platform. You have to trust the government or whoever it is that provide or implemented the solution or paid for the solution. You have to trust whoever is getting the results out from the solution to be accurate. And this is where blockchain can provide a means to ensure transparent, a transparent and trusted voting mechanism. So you could implement this by implementing a right to vote as a token. And this token would be sent to everyone taking part in the system. So if this were to be a board meeting vote, we would send one vote token to each board member. If it was to be national voting, each citizen should receive a vote token and they can only have one vote token. And using the account, using the key that belongs to that account, so let's say using your password like, you would be able to place your vote using that vote token received, you'd be able to place that vote and vote for the motion or the individual that you're backing. And you would then check to make sure that your vote was counted, that it hasn't been changed. Using certain techniques, we won't go into them in this talk, you can ensure that you check that and other individuals cannot check how you voted. So I know that we mentioned that all data in the blockchain is available for all to see, but there are techniques such as zero knowledge proofs where you can guarantee certain assurance for yourself that a uh, vote was placed and accounted and that it still matches what you expected, that it, it's still valid in the system, hasn't been changed. Whilst at the same time, other individuals cannot see how you voted. So there are mechanisms out there to assure that. We can implement smart contracts, put them in place so that they automatically count the votes that have been placed without knowing who the individuals are using some techniques. And only after voting is closed can this actually take place because we don't do, we have the way of being able to close the vote early. So we can implement this all in a blockchain-based solution, right? And we would have a solution where all voters, all users can place a vote and know that their vote has correctly been counted. We can use these in all sorts of areas, such as elections, national, local, or wherever, boards, type of voting process. So in Malta, we recently used a voting process to vote our student representatives in our master's in blockchain and DLT, which was based on blockchain.
education certificates. So consider this, you go to lectures, you study and you sit for your exams. You graduate and you celebrate and you land your first job. You climb the ladder of success and you're the best lawyer, you're the best doctor, the best programmer, you're the best architect, whatever it is you do. However, war breaks out in your country and you need to leave. You go to a new land and you make it your home. You go to an interview and you land the job. And they ask you for your certificate to prove that you are whatever it is that you do. However, your certificate was lost in the war. And not only that, the certificate registry, your university, the registry that stored certificates was destroyed. So there's no way to prove that you are the best doctor, the best lawyer, the best whatever it is that you do, and you can't get this job. Not only that, in your homeland, anyone can say that they are a doctor. Anyone can say that they are a lawyer or whatever it is, because there is no registry that can be checked. And there are no certificates that can be checked. And this is a solution that had been implemented in Malta. So it's block certs, which was developed by Learning Machine, which allows for institutions, schools, universities to issue educational certificates onto a blockchain. So the University, let's say, of Malta has issued an educational certificate certifying that a particular student has graduated inside of a particular university program. The certificate is sent to the individual and the information, the individual's information is owned by that individual. So the confidential information is not actually stored on the blockchain. And then when an individual goes to an employer to prove that they have that certificate, the employer can check on the blockchain to see that what this individual is saying actually holds true. But there are lots of applications out there. And don't really worry about how these applications are implemented, how the blockchain works. Assume for now that it does what it's supposed to do, that the blockchain provides a ledger that cannot be tampered with, that is available for everyone to check, that it only allows for the transfer of money or assets without problems, and it only allows for the owner of those money or assets to transfer those money or assets without requiring a single central authority. So this, now, for those who are technical, yes, definitely they should be going into the workings of blockchain. For those who are not technical, you don't really need to worry about it too much, but you need to understand the principles that are being provided. Because if you think about, let's say, email, how many individuals out there who are non-technical email works over SMTP, that works over TCP, uh, and so on. It's not really important, the how. It's more for the non-technical, what is provided to the users. Okay, so Igor asked, um, how do you go about distributing um, let's say the tokens or the keys or the rights to vote to voters. Um, so let me just explain how we did it in the University of Malta voting process. So because you always need, like, like you're saying, you always need some authority to give out the right to vote. We, we can't get around that. Um, that is unless you want to say everyone in the blockchain, whoever has access to that blockchain, can vote. So for our particular initiative for voting for uh, our student rep and our masters, we issued individual tokens to the students. Now you might question, okay, so you've issued the tokens to the students. Can't you now see how they voted on the blockchain? Um, the thing is, no. So we've also implemented zero knowledge proofs that allow for someone to undertake an action on the blockchain, yet not reveal the full details to the prying eyes of the world. Um, so if we were to look into how could we create a voting system on a larger scale, you would still need an authority to distribute those votes. Now you might consider that at some point in the future, there might be a national entity, much like a national uh, citizenship entity or an ID entity, who will provide each individual with a distributed identity 
uh, token or distributed identity key. And that would be your unique identifier to be able to take place, uh, to, to be able to um, per, uh, undertake national um, elections or actions. Okay, so we'll move on. History of money. Before we look at how blockchain and cryptocurrencies can be regulated and are being regulated, um, it is worth looking briefly at a history of money. So if we trace back money to its origins, we can see that this all started with the concept of uh, what's called commodity money. Objects that are considered to be of value on their own right. Gold has a value associated with it, and gold is what we are exchanging. Commodity money evolved eventually to what is called representative money, where a one pound note, for example, is effectively a promise, a promissory note that you can take to the government and the government would be bound to give you the equivalent of that one pound in gold. So from representative money moved on to fiat money, where nowadays uh, all currencies uh, are. And nowadays, you cannot take your 10 euro note, go to the government and request the equivalent in gold. The worth of the 10 euros is not in the gold that the government is keeping in reserve for when it is being asked for the equivalent in gold, but rather in trust that we give in governments not to overprint euro notes. And therefore, the value of the money is nothing but trust in a central authority in the way they will manage that money. One representation of fiat money is in terms of plastic and electronic money. And we saw over these past few decades, regulation uh, ensuring the right use of uh, digital uh, representations of money. And then came cryptocurrencies. And it is not surprising that the first thing that governments first saw on blockchain was the concept of cryptocurrencies. Because um, cryptocurrencies can be seen as a form of electronic money and electronic money is very heavily regulated. So if we look at the spectrum of digital currency, on the extreme left we find e-money, electronic money, which is very heavily regulated. But beyond the e-money we see cryptocurrencies and the notions of uh, tokens, we'll talk about these in a moment, which are relatively much less regulated. Over these past few years, handful of years, we've seen regulations cropping up in most jurisdictions, but there is yet no unified way in which different jurisdictions are dealing with um, cryptocurrencies and tokens. Tokens are used for a variety of reasons. One use of tokens, for example, is in what is called uh, what are called initial coin offerings. You might have heard the term ICOs. Uh, they were very popular a couple of years ago. And it's worth understanding what tokens are because various blockchain-based systems use tokens. Tokens. Tokens can be seen to be nothing other than smart contracts. And in fact, in most cases, they are actually implemented as smart contracts on uh, DLTs. A token smart contract is one which has a number of standard buttons. For example, it has a button A, which allows anyone to register. So if I'm not yet registered, when I press button A, then I am given an empty wallet. Then there is button B, which I can use to buy tokens. So when I press button B and I pay a certain amount X, then inside the smart contract, there is the code to ensure that I get one token, you can think of this as a plastic coin, put inside my wallet. Thirdly, there is a button C, which allows me to transfer a token from myself to another party. So if I have one of these plastic tokens and I want to transfer it to someone else, I press button C, I specify to whom I want to transfer the token, and the token is transferred to the second party. If I implement these three and possibly some others, then I have a token. And this is precisely what tokens are. Tokens are digital assets which have certain standard ways of interacting with them. And depending on what other functionality is included in the token, uh, allows us to classify what type of token we are dealing with. So, for example, if it is a utility token, a utility token is typically a token that can be used for a particular service. For example, I might sell tokens to be used to play a particular computer game. 
And therefore, what I will do is that I will add a fourth button, button D, which is called get service. So when I press button D, I can only press it if I own at least one token. And when I press it, that token is taken from my wallet and I am given the service. I am allowed to play the game. So utility tokens would be ones that would have these four functionalities built in. Similarly, one can have security tokens, for example, and although um, as a caveat, uh, different jurisdictions define security tokens in different ways. For simplicity here, we'll see a security token as representation of a share or a part ownership of a particular enterprise. And therefore, what we will do is that in a security token smart contract, we'll implement at least two additional buttons, D and D. D allows me to withdraw a share of profits of the enterprise. This can be done only if I own some tokens and I will get um, my share, which depends on how many tokens I own. And the button E, which allows me to vote on future decisions. Clearly, even using just these two categories, which we've presented in a simplified way, it is already clear that different types of tokens require different degrees of regulation associated with them. Regulating DLTs. If we were to look at regulating blockchain and DLTs in detail and look at what different countries have done, one could run a whole course simply on that aspect. But uh, the intention of this slide is simply to give you a brief idea of what the challenges are and what the options are when we try to regulate blockchain and DLTs. So one of the first things to note is that many governments saw the use of blockchain in the first few years as something which was inherently evil. Bitcoin got a lot of bad publicity in terms of its use for criminal activity, but banning the use of decentralized technology is practically impossible. In order to close down the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, governments would have to ensure that every single node, every single computer participating in the Bitcoin network has to be switched off. And this clearly has to be done worldwide level because it is useless to shut down all the servers, all the nodes in a particular country when all the other nodes in other countries are still running. So the question that arose when people tried to address how to regulate such technologies, where can they actually be regulated? Since they are decentralized, can actually a centralized government intervene and ensure that certain things are done in the right way? And what was clear right from the beginning was that there are different options that governments had. Governments could regulate the data itself, what data is written on the blockchain and what it represents. Secondly, another option could be that of regulating simply the cryptocurrencies. So one simply looks at the cryptocurrency economy that is going on on a DLT, on a blockchain, and simply introduce legislation to address the use of that cryptocurrency just as though it were money or just as though it were some form of property. If we see the first few countries that regulated blockchain and blockchain activity, they mostly first limited themselves to regulating the use of cryptocurrency, regulating it in a way that is similar to that of money or of property. And another way in which we can regulate blockchain and DLTs is regulating its use. So can we regulate by saying that certain ways of accessing it or certain ways of certain, certain behavior on it is legal or is not legal? The big problem with this approach is the fact that it's very difficult to regulate the use of, of DLTs when DLTs are decentralized. Fourthly, the idea of regulating ICOs, uh, the initial coin offerings I mentioned earlier. Initially, um, when smart contracts appeared, ICOs were very, very popular. ICOs were used very frequently to pre-fund a form of crowdfunding of ideas. So people would publish a white paper saying what they would like to do and uh, give the opportunity to individuals to buy their tokens, which represent some form of participation in this endeavor to achieve what the white paper is claiming that the, 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 the party will do. These tokens in themselves they became valuable sometimes, and you had the secondary market of people selling and buying these tokens. 
and therefore governments were again eager to regulate this market, particularly because a number of such projects managed to raise the equivalent of millions of euros in funding using these ICOs. Finally, another way is that possibly of regulating smart contracts. Again, lawyers are familiar with the use of the term contract, so they were thinking, okay, so certain types of contracts are not legal, so shouldn't it be the same with smart contracts? Cannot we have a regulation which handles what smart contracts are legal and what smart contracts are? However, this is not easy to do because the concepts of legal contracts do not always translate in a direct manner to smart contracts. Nowadays, there are quite a few international attempts at regulating smart contracts, and one finds different approaches that are used by different jurisdictions. For example, Malta regulates not only virtual financial assets corresponding to the cryptocurrencies and the tokens, but also has legislation to handle the certification of the technology itself. On the other hand, for example, under Swiss law, one finds a strong regime handling cryptocurrencies, handling tokens, which is a very robust framework for these digital assets. Different countries take different approaches. Clearly, because of the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies, there is the need for a unified view of how cryptocurrencies and the blockchain is regulated. But that is still something that we have to see happening in the future. Legal versus smart contracts. It is very unfortunate that smart contracts are so called. Clearly, there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between legal contracts and smart contracts. Many smart contracts are not legal contracts. Many legal contracts cannot be written as smart contracts. But is there a relationship between two concepts? Is it really an either or question? Can an artifact be a legal contract or a smart contract? Or can it actually be partially both? So on one extreme, we've got legal contracts, which talk about the way things should be, the ideal state of affairs, without telling us exactly how to achieve this state of affairs. On the other extreme, we've got fully enforced smart contracts, which execute the logic to achieve a particular state of affairs. However, we can see this as a whole spectrum from legal contracts to fully enforced smart contracts. For example, very close to legal contracts, we can have the concept of legal contracts monitored by smart contracts. So the idea would be that we have a legal contract which says what should happen. So for example, the legal contract might say that I ought to pay Joshua one euro at the end of the week. Then there is a smart contract that observes what happens in the real world. So when I pay Joshua, someone presses a button saying that I really paid Joshua. And the smart contract looks at what is happening and decides whether or not either Joshua or myself are in breach of the contract. So if I do not pay Joshua and the week passes, then the smart contract can raise the red flag saying, Oi, Gordon's in breach of contract. So notice that in this case, we've got a legal contract, which still exists here, but we've got a smart contract that is a form of evidence of a breach of contract. Another option, again, once again, lying between the concept of a legal contract and a fully enforced smart contract, is that of a legal contract partially enforced by a smart contract. So we can take a legal contract, look at the parts that can be enforced using a smart contract. For example, there might be money put in escrow, um, as we saw in the example with the real estate agency. And uh, we can encode those parts as part of a smart contract. And then perhaps the legal contract can talk about people putting money in and withdrawing it from the smart contract, since the smart contract is acting as escrow. So as you can see, it is not simply a question of legal contract or smart contract, but it's really a spectrum of different options that we have. Investigation and intervention. A general view. It is worth looking at what degree of intervention and investigation a blockchain system can allow for. Now, obviously, this depends a lot on the blockchain system in question. Is it public blockchain? Is it a private blockchain? What type of blockchain technology has been used? Because different blockchains have different properties. 
but I'll try to be a little bit general, focusing perhaps a little bit more on public blockchains such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. The first question is, can a DLT system, can a blockchain system be shut down or blocked? One of the things to remember is that each node, each computer on the network contains all the data. There is redundancy of the data. So just closing down some nodes, for example, all the nodes in a particular country, will not stop or block the DLT as a whole. This means that there is no way to easily shut down the DLT if the network is sufficiently widely distributed. So clearly, shutting down and or blocking a DLT system is very challenging. Unlike centralized systems where all you need to do is ensure that the server providing the data is seized or is uh, destroyed by the authorities. Can data be removed or transactions reversed? On a blockchain, each transaction contains a reference to all previous transactions. So modifying a transaction would invalidate all the transactions that happen after it. So notice that this way of uh, encoding a transaction ensures that changing any of the history is impossible to do or very difficult to do. Similarly, data is stored on the blockchain as part of a transaction. So when I send a transaction, when I pay Joshua one Bitcoin, I can send a small piece of data um, in the same way that when I make a bank transfer to Joshua, I can write a small note telling Joshua what the transaction was for. This piece of data is likewise immutable. It's written on the blockchain and is likewise immutable. A group of nodes can decide to go separate ways. So they can decide to undo, for example, the last 1,000 transactions, forget about the last 1,000 transactions, and start off a new network from what happened uh, 1,000 transactions ago. This is called a fork, since what it effectively does is it creates two separate networks, those continuing to use the data until the most recent transaction, and those that opted to go for the transactions uh, until 1,000 transactions ago. When a fork happens, you create two new blockchains with two different decentralized ledgers. Clearly, for a fork to happen and to be able to forget the last so many transactions, you need the whole community or a large portion of the community, at least 50% plus one of the community, to participate in the fork. And this has happened in the past. This has happened on various blockchain systems, including large ones such as Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum. Your identity remains on both. Your transactions happening, say in this example I'm giving, before the past thousand transactions will still be stored there. And effectively, if Ethereum were to fork tomorrow, the Ether that you own would be stored on both. So this creates a copy of the ledger which extends separately. So you can spend your ether on one fork or you can spend your ether on the other fork independently of each other. One could argue that this is an instance of double spending, but notice that you cannot double spend on the same fork. Clearly, the value of the underlying uh, cryptocurrency falls if the division of participants of the nodes is more or less, for example, close to 50% in both cases. If one dominates, if one is 90% of the users and the other is 10%, then most probably what will happen is that the value of the 90% will remain more or less intact, whereas the value of the 10% will fall quickly. But forks are the only way in which we typically can forget about the last few transactions. Thirdly, can a smart contract be shut down or blocked? Imagine we have a smart contract that is not functioning well. So we've had this, we had smart contracts that had bugs, which resulted in people losing their money. For example, a very famous case was when due to a bug, a piece of code that did not work, the money people stored in a smart contract could not be withdrawn. Imagine that when we programmed that real estate agency um, smart contract, we wrote something by mistake, which did not allow the real estate uh, company to withdraw its money. So can we somehow intervene and, you know, force that smart contract to change its logic to now start functioning correctly? 
Unfortunately, this is not an option because the logic of a smart contract is immutable. It is written on the blockchain. It is written there once and for all. So once a smart contract is written on the blockchain, it cannot be changed and its logic cannot be modified. That is the strength of a smart contract, we said earlier. But clearly, it is also a weakness in another sense. What we could do is that a smart contract might include some logic to either modify it or to stop it or to break it open, for example. So, for example, in a system which stores uh, owner's money, we could have a particular button that if 80% of the owners of uh, digital assets inside that smart contract were to press that button, then the smart contract would be terminated and all the money would be returned. Obviously, the use of such logic means that there are additional points of trust. In this case, you're trusting that 80% of the participants are willing to press that button. On the other hand, I could encode it that for a particular person can press that button to break the smart contract open. If so, I need to trust that particular party. What about investigating native transactions? We already discussed whether transactions on a DLT are visible. On public blockchains, mostly, these transactions are fully visible by all parties. So you can always look at transactions happening on the Bitcoin network or on the Ethereum network. You won't see my name there, but you, you will see unique IDs. And if at some stage you can associate a unique ID with me, then you know um, that all transactions with that unique ID correspond to my transactions. On private and permissioned blockchains, mostly restrict visibility to the participants, but this really depends on the settings um, one uses when one sets up an instance of such a blockchain. What about investigating users? Since DLTs do not associate their IDs with real-world IDs, an ID on a DLT system and a real person is not always easy to make. However, in practice, if one looks at the history of transactions that a particular party is making, one can try to deduce who that particular party is. And there have been various cases um, where people were actually prosecuted for transactions they made by the investigative uh, authorities looking at the history of transactions and linking a particular address with a particular person. But as I said, this requires investigation outside the blockchain to make this association. So if you are interested in learning more about blockchain, we do have a master's in blockchain and DLT at the University of Malta. Allows for IT, law, and business and finance and economics professionals to, number one, get an introduction to the field, an introduction to the various aspects of the field. We provide introductions to the areas that are not yours. So if you are a lawyer or a finance professional, you would receive introduction to smart contract programming and an introduction to other blockchain concepts. An IT professional, you would receive introduction to the law, introduction to business related aspects. And then we dig deeper into your area of specialization. So we cover for IT professionals, how to build blockchains from the ground up, how to write smart contracts, advanced smart contracts. If you're a, a law professional, we dig deeper into legal aspects. If you're a business professional, we look into applied economics and tokenomics and money systems, banking systems, cryptocurrency systems. So this is the idea. It's a multidisciplinary master's where you not only get an introduction to blockchain, you get an introduction to the other perspectives of blockchain that are not from your particular profession, then we dig deeper into your particular profession. Okay, so thanks very much for joining us. We hope that that was um, slightly entertaining and it helped you get through uh, COVID. We know it was a bit long. We really wanted to cram in a lot of material into this. Um, so thank you for those students who reached out to me and have inquired to join our master's program. Um, I'll definitely be getting back um, as soon as possible. If you have any questions or you want to discuss any other aspects, Gordon and I would be more than willing to uh, reach out and uh, have a discussion offline if required. Uh, Gordon?
for uh, participating in this. Um, uh, as Joshua pointed out, uh, feel free to send us questions and we'll be more than happy uh, to engage with you um, offline on this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye.